lived for a number of years um, abroad, and when you live in a foreign country, you learn a few things about the ways that other people do things. There are, you know, the funny differences. We learned or were come face to face with the reality that counting in French is goofy. It takes a long while, I think it took me four years, before the number 97 would come out of my mouth with any facility. Because unlike in English, where we say 97, seems pretty sensible, in French it's 42010 And it just doesn't flow naturally that way. Their words for above and below are so similar that at least these American ears and this American mouth cannot distinguish them, which makes um, navigating a little bit difficult. And then there are the awkward differences about toilets being in their own room, separate from the sink and the shower. There's some benefits to that, and there's some drawbacks to that. Washing machines might well be found in the kitchen, because that's where the plumbing is. Floor numbers start with zero rather than one. So you need to remember that if someone is telling you they're on the first floor, they're really on the second floor unless they're American, in which case you have to clarify whose first floor you're talking about because we're all very confused. It takes a while for your brain to adjust to a new kind of normal. But the truth is, after a while, living in a different sort of culture, you realize you're learning an awful lot about yourself as well. There are those few things that aren't just different. They really bug you. They feel wrong in some sort of more fundamental way, and it's not just hard to get used to them. You're really kind of cranky about having to do that. And I learned that in France, people know how to rest. People know how to rest. It might be a, a legacy of Christianity and Sabbath keeping. It might be a legacy of the labor movement. It might be some combination of the two, but they know how to rest. And I learned that I am American. Officially, I was very open-minded to this new version of normal. It sounds very lovely on the surface. And in practice, I found it surprisingly frustrating years into this time, still not used to the way that folks rest. Stores are not open on Sunday. If you did not buy it on Saturday, you will not have it. Period. Sorry. Too bad there's a potluck tonight. Come up with something else out of the pantry. Restaurants are closed on Mondays, unless it's Tuesday, or sometimes you you don't know, and you show up and there's a little sign that says closed on Wednesdays. Well, that's not what It was last time we were here. Lunch is two hours. And only big establishments make sure that someone is covering that gap when you're free to take your business to the store. Well, no, they're out off at lunch. School and work are off at the drop of a hat. Pentecost, great. Friday and Monday are off. Absolutely always. But Pentecost, it's the middle of February. Why are we having a week off? Well, everyone knows it's the ski holidays. There are ski, okay. There are many ways that this is lovely. Leisurely meals, actual time for everyone to spend with their families, and actual rest. But I learned that I'm American. And in America, money makes the world go round, and if I want to spend it, you bend over backwards to let me do that. In America, the customer is always right. I had no idea just how deeply that had permeated me until I tried to live differently and not go to the Bloomin' grocery store on Sunday. This customer needed to shop on Sunday. Right now, I need it. And we are so used to the world moving around our convenience and our need. A store does not, in America, close for a month. You might see a little sign that says, gone to lunch back in 15 minutes. But in France, there were handwritten signs quite regularly on the door that said, um, and I think it was just for us Americans that had invaded an entirely too large of numbers. The sign said, August is vacation time. See you in September. An entire month. Well, what about pharmacies? 
What about pharmacies, I remember as I was adjusting. They have to be open in case of emergency. Well, yeah, there is one that rotates. It's open. Somewhere within sort of a half an hour, 40-minute drive, you can get a prescription filled if it's an emergency. It's interesting how your definition of emergency changes when you think about sort of an hour and 20 minutes that maybe I don't need that Advil. I think I'll take a nap and drink a glass of water. They know how to rest. And the way that this rest inconvenienced Americans was universally galling. We just had a hard time getting used to it. This is no way to run an economy, no way to take care of your customers, and it's so inconvenient. I don't think that I thought I was the center of the world, but apparently I believed it a little bit. And here is what Sabbath is for, friends. Sabbath is there to teach me and to teach you that other people do not exist for our convenience. Other people do not exist for our convenience. The Sabbath day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your ox, your donkey, any livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Other people do not exist for our convenience. And it must be a fundamental temptation of all of humanity, or it wouldn't be in scripture that is thousands of years old. But friends, it's an especially fundamental sin of our culture and our world, isn't it? Think about how frustrated we get when someone is slow in the checkout line. You've added two minutes to my day. How stores are open 24 hours a day, maybe closing one day a year. And you only have to work retail for about five minutes to know how awful we can be to the people we think are there to make our lives more convenient. One of the reasons that Sabbath exists as a central command from God is that the second we get any power, whether it's money or social standing or whatever it might be, we are liable to try to use our neighbors and to use them up. We are liable to try to use this world God created and to use it up. So rest is a commandment. And it comes above not murdering and not stealing, just beneath not blasphemy, right? So it's way up there in the priority list for our God that rest should be a commandment. We like it for ourselves. It doesn't seem like it needs to be commanded, but of course we're not so keen on rest for other people. Resident aliens and oxen and donkeys, children and servants, even if you've amassed power over all of these things, they do not exist for your convenience, God says. One of the texts about keeping the Sabbath in the Bible even says there's no lighting of fires to be done. And scholars say, well, you know who lit the fires? And you know what the fires were for? The children and the women took care of the fires so that they could cook for everyone else. And if it's a Sabbath where there are fires lit, guess what? Somebody's going to have to be cooking, and it's only Sabbath for some people. Other people do not exist for our convenience. They exist because God wanted them to exist. Because God created them and said, oh, nice. Right? Do you remember that first creation story we have in Scripture where God creates and says, whoa, something else. Nice. This is good. Over and over and over again. It makes me wonder what God did on that seventh day when God rested. Maybe watch the baby goats or climb a tree, maybe wiggle toes in the sand to see what it feels like for us. Maybe, maybe God watched humanity and said, oh, she's learning how to jump. Or, oh, they look so funny when they sneeze. God seems to have created the world out of God's abundance and joy. And that world does not exist for me to possess it or for your convenience. Freedom isn't just about one or two of us. It's for everyone. And of course, the great good news of this commandment that we have to observe the Sabbath is there in the last line. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. 
the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Not just to worship, which is important. That's one way of honoring this God who saves. Not just to rest. That's important and a way of honoring this God who saves, but also as a resistance to all the other powers that are not the Lord our God. All the systems and powers that would try to say, you're mine, I own you. Economies that'll chew us up and spit us out. The sinfulness in ourselves and others that has us believing that we are only as valuable as the dollar in our pocket or the image on our face. None of those things are the Lord your God. Despite millennia of things that want to rule us and own us, the great good news is that we belong to a God whose chief joy seems to be setting us free. This story of freedom is the heart of the Hebrew Scriptures. And then the heart of the, the, the New Testament, the Greek Scriptures, is the story of God going even farther. And saying, not just slavery, but sin and death. I am going to free you from everything that would try to own you. And the Sabbath exists to honor that God who frees us. A day to remember that we are not owned by our work or our employment or any of the systems of getting enough or more than enough that our world has. Only God is in charge. I've been... Uh, Lucky in harvesting strawberries this year, and it's had me remembering markets in France. And we had to learn that when you buy strawberries at the market in France, they are good for 12 hours. They sell you strawberries that will be mush if you don't tend to them right away. It's so inconvenient. They'd never dream of selling you strawberries that would last a week because those taste like sawdust. Strawberries that are a day from rotting, oh, those taste like heaven. It's terribly inconvenient. You have to stop what you're doing. You have to just eat all the strawberries at once. It's, it's like God giving us the Sabbath, I think. Look, here, smell these. Do you really want to trade this wonderful moment that is a gift for some potential halfway version that you might be able to create for yourself if you work hard enough someday. Sabbath says, don't settle. God made the strawberries. God says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Thanks be to God. 